Our lecture for this week is uh, beginning a series on various arguments for God's existence. Uh, and we're going to begin with an argument that is perhaps the most confusing arguments of what are called the traditional arguments for God's existence. Uh, so when you look at the traditional arguments, usually you're looking at arguments like uh, the ontological argument, which we're going to be looking at uh, here in this lecture. Uh, but there are also two other main arguments that have traditionally been given. Uh, an argument called the cosmological argument, uh, which is actually a class of arguments that we'll look at uh, here next week. Um, and then there's the teleological argument, which is also another class of arguments that we'll be looking at in a couple weeks. Uh, but for this week, uh, we are looking at what I think is probably the most confusing uh, of these traditional arguments. Um, and so I should say uh, right from the beginning that when I was first introduced to this argument in college, I was a freshman. Uh, I actually thought that this argument was a joke. Uh, and I remember sitting in class, being introduced to the argument, uh, and we were given an assignment where we had to write in our own words what the argument was, and then after we articulated the argument in our own words, then we had to give our response to it. Now, when I did that assignment, it confirmed for me that this argument must, in fact, be a joke. I didn't take it seriously, uh, but as I look back uh, at that time when I was a freshman, uh, I realize now that I really didn't have a decent understanding of the argument. Uh, and so one of the things that I'm going to be doing in this lecture is give you my early version of the argument as I understood it, um, and then hopefully show you why that argument isn't completely correct. Um, and then I'm also going to tell you how uh, later, I was reintroduced to the argument uh, when I was in seminary, um, and it was actually there where I was introduced to a better version of the argument. Uh, it was put forward by uh, my philosophy professor at the time named uh, Paul Helm, and I remember sitting in on that class where he was walking through the argument, uh, and at that time, I realized that the argument was actually quite profound. Uh, now, what's funny about that is I remember having this light bulb moment in class thinking that this was probably one of the best arguments that I've ever heard of in my life. Uh, and then later that evening when I was back at home, I was reading through my notes. I was actually, for my own benefit, trying to rewrite the argument in my own words again. And at that point, I couldn't do it. Um, and the light bulb just went away. Uh, but since then, I've uh, had plenty of time to look through the argument, uh, looking at different versions of it, different articulations of it. Um, and I think now, whether or not you find it a persuasive argument for God's existence or not, um, I think this is one of the more profound arguments uh, that has ever been presented in philosophy. And my hope for you is that you might have a little bit of a light bulb moment with this. Um, but if not, um, I'm not really expecting that because that wasn't my first experience, and it's usually not most people's first experience with the argument. Uh, but if you don't have a light bulb experience, uh, hopefully you'll have at least somewhat of an understanding of it. Um, and so be to begin, uh, I think it's helpful to just note that to really get at what the ontological argument is about, um, it's an argument about definitions. Uh, specifically, it's about the definition of God. Uh, and I don't want you to think that calling this a definitional argument means that it's a semantic argument. I don't think it's a semantic argument uh, because when we're talking about definitions, we're really talking about our understanding of the concept of God. And so as I understand the ontological argument, uh, it's an argument saying that if you have a proper understanding of God, the nature of God, then it follows logically that God must exist. And so we'll talk about the argument here in a moment, but I want us to connect this back to what we were talking about last week when we were looking at Michael Peterson's argument on metaphysical theism. Uh, so if you remember, Peterson argues that uh, to understand what we're talking about when we're talking about the existence of God, we have to think in metaphysical categories. And so theism, from a worldview perspective, according to Peterson, is that it's the conviction or the idea that the first cause of all of reality, I mean, the first cause of, I mean, I suppose we should say the first cause of the universe, is immaterial. Uh, so it's something that exists outside the universe, transcends the universe, and it's conscious. Uh, and so to talk about a conscious first cause, you're talking about something that's like a mind, something that's thinking, planning, purposing. Uh, and that's what we mean when we uh, use the word God. And this is the metaphysical theist claim. Uh, 
And Peterson contrasts that with metaphysical naturalism, which argues for an unconscious first cause. Uh, so in other words, the first cause of the universe is not something that's a thinking thing. It's not a mind. Uh, it's something that is either material, and in this sense, you're probably thinking about something like a multiverse. So we might be a, a, a universe that has a parent universe that brought us into existence uh, or some other material first cause. Or you could go on the other hand and say, no, there was an immaterial first cause, but that immaterial first cause isn't God, it's unconscious. So then you would come up with labels like nothing brought the universe into existence. Uh, maybe you give a mathematical explanation for the first cause of the universe, or maybe we're thinking of some sort of Platonic forms. Uh, but what Peterson's doing here is he's trying to help us understand what the concept of theism is, and then he contrasts that with metaphysical naturalism. Um, and so basically what he's arguing is that theism and naturalism are competing claims about the nature of ultimate reality. Um, and really this goes back to a distinction that was made by the philosopher Anaximander, uh, one of the early pre-Socratic philosophers, where he wrote that uh, everything either is a beginning or it has a beginning, but, Anaximander says, there is no beginning to the infinite. Now, in the writings of Anaximander, he is making a distinction between what you might call a contingent reality or contingent objects versus what might be called uh, a necessary object. Um, and actually, I think of the ontological argument as being sort of in this tradition, and we'll uh, hopefully understand why in a moment. Uh, but to understand the distinctions that Anaximander was making is uh, we could do this thought experiment uh, where we can start to imagine uh, what things exist just contingently and what things exist necessarily. Uh, so now things that exist contingently uh, are things that you could imagine to not exist. Uh, so you could imagine for this world to not exist, this room, uh, the universe to not exist. Um, basically anything that you could imagine not existing is something that is contingent. And once you go through a thought experiment where you start imagining things out of existence, for Anaximander, you get to something that is sort of just prime reality, uh, what he calls this indeterminate boundlessness, the apeiron. And when you get there, you're at some necessary reality that is uh, the explanation for why everything else exists. Uh, it's prime reality or, or ultimate reality. And uh, the ontological argument is uh, kind of within that tradition. Now, to get the first uh, version of this argument, we need to come to a philosopher and theologian named Anselm. And he is the one who introduces us to the ontological argument. Um, now, I should say, just uh, to prepare us for this argument, that when Anselm is... Uh, given his version of this argument, he's actually given this argument in a prayer that he is praying to God. Uh, so you might say, I mean, I might uh, suspect that Anselm is not thinking that this is going to be an argument uh, to be understood uh, as a philosophical treatise. Um, now, later philosophers have taken it as that, uh, but I, I see this as being an argument that he's giving uh, to God, but also for his own benefit uh, to uh, help him have a stronger faith in God. And uh, he says, Lord, you who grant understanding to faith, grant that insofar as you know it is useful for me, that I may understand that you exist as we believe you to exist. Um, and so he is in this tradition that was really started with uh, St. Augustine, uh, this faith-seeking understanding tradition. Uh, so he believes that God exists, um, and he's praying to God, God, I believe that you exist, but can you give me an understanding to know why my faith is valid? And it's in this prayer that he's thinking about the concept of God, and he actually prays to God that you are something than which nothing greater can be thought. Now, this is the definition of God that Anselm is going to be working with. Uh, you are something than which none greater can be thought, because if something greater could be thought, then that thing couldn't be God, because God is the greatest conceivable being. And, so Anselm says, God exists so truly 
that God cannot thought be thought to not exist. Uh, this is the point that he's going to want to make, because if you could think of God not existing, then God would not be God. God would not be necessary. Uh, in other words, you cannot even conceive of God not existing. And so let's look at a few uh, passages here from Anselm's prayer uh, to understand uh, this argument or to get at least a glimpse of what the argument is. Uh, so Anselm writes, When a fool, and here Anselm is, uh, when he uses the word fool, he's really referring to somebody who doesn't believe. Um, so when a fool, one who doesn't believe, hears me say, hears me say, something than which none greater can be thought, he surely understands what he hears. And what he hears, what he understands, it exists in his understanding, even if he does not understand that it exists in reality. Conclusion, so even the fool must admit that something than which nothing greater can be thought exists at least in his understanding. So, what he's saying is, when I'm having an argument with somebody who doesn't believe, and I am talking about God, something that which not greater can be thought, the person who's hearing me at least understands what I'm saying. And what that means is, if he understands what I'm saying, then he's saying, at least the concept of God can exist in the understanding. But now Anselm goes on. And surely, that than which a greater cannot be thought cannot exist only in the understanding. For, if it exists only in the understanding, it can be thought to exist in reality as well, which is greater. So what follows from that? Well, according to Anselm, this is what follows. If that which, which a greater cannot be thought exists only in the understanding, then that which a greater cannot be thought is that than which a greater can be thought. And so do you notice the contradiction here? Uh, well, he's pointing out that it is a contradiction, and he says that's clearly impossible. Therefore, there is no doubt that something than which a greater cannot be thought exists both in the understanding and in reality. Uh, now, one of the things I think might be helpful for you to do at this point is maybe pause and try to bullet point the argument in your own words, if you can, uh, so you can understand... Um, Anselm's train of thought. Um, now, here is my attempt to bullet point the argument when I first uh, heard this argument uh, as a freshman, and I want to give you my bullet point. Uh, you can compare it with your bullet point, um, and I'm going to walk through with you my first attempt at doing this uh, to help you see why I thought the argument was a joke, and then hopefully I can show you why uh, I no longer find it to be a joke of an argument. Um, but the first premise that I wrote when I first bullet pointed this argument uh, was premise one, uh, I have an idea of a perfect God. So I was able to get in my understanding an idea of this greatest conceivable being, a perfect God. Okay, premise two, God would be more perfect if he existed than not. Okay, that, conclusion, therefore God exists. Uh, that's how I understood Anselm's argument when I first, um, first read through it. Um, now, one of the assignments that I was given as a freshman was, okay, after you bullet point the argument, then write your response to it. And this was the response that I wrote uh, to the argument. Uh, so my response to premise one was uh, simply a question, who says that my idea is perfect? Um, so perfection is, is subjective, and so you could have a different idea of perfection than what I have, and so I didn't think that premise one was very persuasive. Uh, but even if it were, I moved on to premise two and said, well, maybe it would be more impressive for God to create if God didn't exist at all. And my logic here was I use an analogy. Uh, let's suppose that I was doing magic uh, and I had my hat and I pulled a rabbit out of the hat. Well, that seems pretty impressive to do that. For any magician to pull a rabbit out of the hat is, is very impressive to do. Uh, but now, wouldn't it be more impressive if... Uh, I didn't exist as a magician, and then I pulled the rabbit out of the hat. Uh, that surely is more impressive, and so that's kind of the analogy that I was uh, using to explain why I didn't think premise two was persuasive. Uh, 
Uh, but even, I said, even if I accepted premise one and premise two, surely the conclusion doesn't follow because this argument can prove a perfect anything. Uh, it could prove that a perfect pizza would exist or a perfect ice cream cone or anything. And so this argument didn't seem to be persuasive. Uh, and in fact, uh, that, that argument that I gave against the conclusion uh, goes back all the way to the time of Anselm. Uh, one of the first responders to Anselm's argument uh, was uh, another theologian named Ganilio, uh, who wrote that a fool can perhaps reply this way, Anselm. Uh, there are those who say that somewhere in the world, uh, somewhere in the ocean, is an island. Uh, therefore, you cannot any longer doubt this island, which is more excellent than any others on the earth, that it truly exists somewhere in reality, because uh, you do not doubt that this island exists only in your understanding, and if it's more excellent for it to exist not merely in the understanding but also in reality, then this island must exist, uh, for if it did not, any land that exists in reality would be greater than it. Uh, could I not also be said to have in my understanding any number of false things that have no real existence at all in themselves, since if someone were to speak of them, I would understand whatever it is that he said. And so this kind of confirmed my critique uh, of the argument um, that if, if you really accept the conclusion of the ontological argument, you can prove a perfect anything, including a perfect island. Uh, well then, later in my college years, uh, I came across a book by Richard Dawkins called The God Delusion, uh, and he spent basically a half a page on uh, the ontological argument because he also thought that it was a joke. Uh, and the way that he uh, explained the argument was he imagined a conversation between two kids on a playground arguing about the existence of God. And he thought the argument uh, was no more sophisticated than, than this. Uh, so the first kid says to the other kid, uh, bet you I can prove that God exists. The other kid says, but you can't. First kid says, well, right then. Imagine the most perfect, 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 perfect thing possible. Okay, now what? Uh, well, now, is that perfect, perfect, perfect thing real? Does it exist? Other kid says, well, no, it's just in my mind. Ah, says the first kid. But if it was real, it would be even more perfect because a really, really perfect thing would have to be so much better than a silly old imaginary thing. So, I prove that God exists. Uh, Dawkins' response to this was, all you have to do is state the argument to realize that it's absurd. Um, and again, um, my feelings of the argument was confirmed again. This argument must be a joke. Uh, but I told you that when I got to seminary, uh, I was reintroduced to the argument. And I want to kind of walk you through uh, where I started to turn and think that the argument was profound. Uh, so the first moment where I started to reconsider the argument was actually reading uh, the atheist philosopher Bertrand Russell. Um, now, reading uh, Russell didn't help me understand the argument, but it just made me curious that there was a philosopher like Russell who was an atheist, a famous logician, a very good philosopher, who thought that the argument was at least uh, worth some serious consideration. And Russell writes... I remember the precise moment, one day in 1894, as I was walking along Trinity Lane, when I saw a flash, or thought I saw, so now this is Russell's light bulb moment, he said, I saw a flash, or thought I saw, that the ontological argument is valid. Now, to go back to uh, just some basic understandings of logic, to say that an argument is valid is to say that if each premise in the argument is true, then it follows that the conclusion must be true. Um, so it's just talking about the structure of an argument. Uh, so an argument can be valid and not sound. Uh, so you could have a, a premise in the argument that is false, and even if it's uh, a valid argument, the conclusion wouldn't necessarily be true if you have one of the premises being false. Uh, so you need to have a sound argument, uh, which means not only is the argument valid, but it means each premise is also true. And if you have a valid argument which, where each premise is true, then the argument, or then the conclusion must be true, which means it's a sound argument. Uh, so that's the difference between valid and sound arguments. Uh, 
Uh, so he's saying, at this point, I remember going out and I saw that the argument was valid. He continues, I had gone out to buy a tin of tobacco, and on my way back, I suddenly threw it up in the air and exclaimed as I caught it, Great Scott, the ontological argument is sound. Now, when I first read that, I thought, how could Russell think that this argument is sound? Uh, and in fact, he wrote later in a different place that it's much easier to be persuaded that ontological arguments are no good than it is to say exactly what is wrong with them. Uh, so as a logician, he said the ontological argument is sound. Now, he never became a theist, he never started to believe in God. Uh, but he, he did say that there was something about it that was profound, that was sound, uh, but still wasn't necessarily persuaded of his theism. Uh, so now I want to walk through a version of the argument that's a little bit better than the first version that I heard of it. And uh, the better version goes this way. So premise one, God exists in the understanding, but not in reality. Uh, now I need to explain something about this premise. So the type of argument that's going to be set up here is what's called a reductio ad absurdum argument. And in these types of arguments, what you do is you set out a premise that you want to show leads to uh, a logical uh, fallacy that leads to something that is logically incoherent. Uh, so you start with this premise, and if you can show that a logical contradiction derives from this first premise, then you've demonstrated the opposite of what the first premise is. Uh, so in this argument, you want to actually show that uh, premise one is wrong, uh, and you begin with the argument that you're trying to disprove. So, premise one, God exists in the understanding, but not in reality. Two, existence in reality is greater than existence in the understanding alone. Three, God's existence is conceivable, his existence in reality. Four, if God did exist in reality, then God would be greater than God. Now this just comes from uh, one and two of the argument. Five, it is conceivable that there is a being greater than God is. And that comes from three and four. But now, when you get to six, think about what you just said. You just said, it is conceivable that there is a being greater than the being which nothing greater can be conceived. Uh, because that's the definition of God that we're working with here. Uh, so do you see the contradiction here? There's a contradiction, which means that it is false that God exists in the understanding, but not in reality. Because if you understand God correctly, then God is the greatest conceivable being and you're uttering a contradiction in step six of the argument. Uh, so, okay. So what do we do with this argument? Uh, well, many of philosophers have said that the, the biggest problem with this argument is step two. Um, now, I should say before I uh, give you an explanation of step two, it might be uh, helpful to just pause at this moment, uh, read through the argument to make sure that you have a good understanding of it. Um, but uh, if you don't do that, I'm just going to keep working through it uh, and give you um, some of the responses to it. Uh, but let's start with uh, the response to premise two. Uh, so many have pointed out that uh, there is a problem with premise two in this argument, and this is the debatable premise. Uh, and the first challenge to this comes from the philosopher Immanuel Kant, uh, who simply said that existence is not a predicate. Now you should ask yourself, what does Kant mean when he says this? Uh, well, we can get some help from just a dictionary, if you don't remember back to your days in grammar, English. Uh, what exactly is a predicate? Uh, well, a predicate is the part of a sentence or a clause containing a verb and stating uh, something about the subject. Uh, so if you take the statement, John went home, uh, the part of the sentence, went home, is giving you information about the subject, John. Uh, so when Kant says that existence is not a predicate, 
what he's saying is that existence doesn't tell you anything about the subject uh, that it's referring to. Uh, so if I am wanting to tell you something about me, so I can say, uh, Mike is five foot 11. Uh, so when I say five foot 11, I'm giving you some information about me. Uh, when I say Mike has blue eyes, I'm giving you another predicate about me. I'm telling you information about me. I am the subject Mike. Uh, I can list out a number of different predicates that give you information about me, but what Kant is saying is when I utter the phrase, Mike exists, the phrase or the, the term existence is not giving you any new information about the subject uh, because I can list out uh, a number of predicates about myself and you can kind of get a mental image of who I am. Uh, but when I say, and Mike exists, I haven't increased your mental image about who I am. And this is his main criticism of the argument. Uh, so when you list out, say, the attributes of God, you can say that God is all-knowing. Well, the phrase all-knowing is giving you some information about the concept of God. Uh, God is all-powerful. That's giving you more information about uh, the term God. Uh, but the word existence, Kant says, is not giving you any more information. And so it's not correct to say that existence in reality is greater than existence in the understanding alone. Uh, so that is uh, perhaps the greatest response to the ontological argument that has been uh, offered from my perspective. Uh, but we might ask, okay, well, what, what would anyone do with this argument? Even if you thought it was good, what would you do? Uh, well, here are uh, a few things that you might do with this argument. Um, you might uh, use this argument as a response to uh, the evidentialist challenge to religious belief in God. Uh, so the evidentialist challenge uh, is what we talked about in our last lecture uh, that simply states that one is justified in lacking belief in God if she does not see evidence for God. Uh, so uh, there are many different ways that you can explain this argument. Uh, you have Bertrand Russell's teapot uh, where he says that uh, the person who's claiming that a teapot is orbiting around the moon uh, is making a positive claim, uh, but the person who doesn't think that there's a teapot orbiting around the moon is just lacking belief in that particular claim. Uh, and therefore, if you're lacking belief, you don't have any burden to demonstrate that your lack of belief is reasonable. You just lack belief. Uh, in other words, the person asserting a claim is the person who is, uh, has the burden to demonstrate that that claim is reasonable. Uh, and so when it comes... At, to being used as an argument against the existence of God, uh, you can use this evidentialist challenge uh, to say that if somebody lacks belief in the Mormon Heavenly Father or the Flying Spaghetti Monster or Russell's Teapot or Zeus or Yahweh, uh, if one is lacking belief, they have no burden to prove. Uh, it's only the person who's uh, asserting a claim that has the burden. Well, how does the ontological argument uh, uh, relate to this specific challenge? Uh, well, in the words of Anselm, Anselm says this, to think a thing is to think the word that signifies that thing. But in another sense, to think a thing is to understand that exactly the thing is. Uh, so I want to point out two parts of these two sentences. So he says you can think the word, and in another sense, you can understand. What is Anselm saying here? Uh, I think what Anselm is saying is that when you are debating any topic, let's say we're talking about the existence of God for this argument, uh, does God exist? Is it reasonable uh, to believe in God? Uh, Anselm is saying, well, you can say God does not exist. And in that sense, you're using the word God, and you can utter the phrase, God does not exist. Uh, but when you're using the word God, you're thinking the word, Anselm says, but that doesn't mean you're thinking about God. It doesn't mean you understand exactly the thing that you're thinking of. Uh, you're only thinking the word, you're not thinking what the thing is. And Anselm is saying this because he says if you want to understand the debate correctly, um, and this kind of relates to what Peterson was talking about in the last lecture, you have to understand exactly what it is you're talking about. Uh, you can't just think the word God, 
you have to think about the actual being of God itself, and that is exactly what the thing is. Uh, and so in other words, uh, this relates to the evidentialist challenge, uh, simply saying that the evidentialists are making a category mistake when they're saying that uh, God does not exist, uh, because the thinking of God as a t contingent being and not as a necessary being. And so Anselm says, God can be thought not to exist in the first sense, but not in the second sense, because no one who understands what God is can even think that God does not exist. And so what is Anselm saying here? Well, again, Anselm's defining God as that which none greater can be conceived. And this goes back again to Anaximander, uh, who says there's two different types of beings. There's contingent beings and necessary beings. And when, when Anselm says that which none greater can be, can be conceived, uh, he's conceiving of God as a necessary being. And so if we understand God correctly, then we understand God as a necessary being, that which none greater can be conceived. And so in other words, if we think again of the realm of contingency, that you and me are both contingent, uh, this room is contingent, the world is contingent, the universe exists in, is contingent, uh, basically, the square on your screen uh, is, is everything in all of reality that is contingent. So everything within that box is a contingent thing. But now, what Anselm and other philosophers have argued is that there's a reality outside the realm of contingency, which is the realm of necessity. This is the realm of self-existence, uh, where the negation of this realm cannot be rationally conceived. And so the way that this relates to the evidentialist challenge is that all of the or all of the thinkers who have thought that the evidentialist challenge works are conceiving of God as a contingent reality inside the box, where Anselm is saying the God that I'm conceiving of is outside the box. Uh, God is that which none greater can be conceived. Uh, and so that is Anselm's version of the argument. Uh, but now I want to turn to uh, an updated version of the argument uh, using modal logic. Uh, it's been presented by many different philosophers. I'm going to give you Alvin Plantinga's version of this argument uh, because that's a part of your readings for this week. Uh, but to understand this modal ontological argument, um, you need just a basic understanding of what's called possible world semantics. Uh, so using possible world semantics, a possible world is just a hypothetical reality, uh, which is something that could have been. Uh, so when we're talking about a possible world, uh, really we're thinking about any logical world that could have existed. There could have been uh, a world where I would not have been born. Um, that's a logically possible world. Uh, there are a number of different things. Anything that could be different in the actual world uh, is a possible world. There's a possible world where uh, COVID-19 uh, would have never uh, become a pandemic around the world. That's a possible world. Um, and so a possible world is not an actual world. So you're, I don't want this to be confused with uh, the idea of maybe a multiverse or maybe there's another actual world out there that's just slightly different than ours. Uh, this is just a logical conception. Uh, if you can conceive of something being different than the way that it actually is, you're conceiving of a possible world. And modal logic, therefore, is just a tool for discovering whether or not something is logically possible. And so something can be logically possible, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, actually physically possible. Um, and so sometimes uh, people who are first introduced to modal logic can get be frustrated, or just logic in general can be frustrated by this, uh, because according to modal logic, um, a cow could probably jump over the moon, uh, even though that's not actually physically possible, that's uh, logically possible. Um, but it, really, when you think about modal logic, just think of it as a tool for discovering what things are logically possible. Uh, that's all we're doing when it comes to modal logic. Um, so now, when you're using modal logic, uh, you would say things like this. So if P, any proposition, exists in every possible world, uh, then essentially what you're saying is that one cannot logically conceive of P not existing. Uh, so if P exists in every possible world that can be conceived, then you can't uh, conceive of the negation of P. Uh, and if P does exist in any possible world, um, then 
or sorry, if you're saying that P does not exist in any possible world, then what you're saying is that P is actually logically incoherent. Uh, so that's essentially what you're doing in possible world semantics. Uh, so to get kind of a visual of this, hopefully this is helpful. Uh, so the actual world will represent uh, by this circle called X. So again, the actual world is everything that's true in the world right now. Uh, possible world A is just something that could be slightly different. Uh, possible world B is things being different than even possible world A or uh, the actual world X. You have possible world C. Uh, and then you have here possible world infinity. Um, I mean, you could probably have an infinite number of possible worlds uh, because you could change just any number of things in the actual world, and then you have a possible world. Uh, so let's just take some statements to see what we mean. Uh, so again, the statement uh, might exist in X, but not in A. Uh, that statement is logically coherent uh, because there is a possible world where I would have never been born. Uh, so this is a statement that somebody could stay, could utter logically. Um, it's a logically valid, or it's a logically possible statement. Uh, you could also take this statement. Uh, unicorns do not exist in X, uh, so we live in a world, uh, presumably, where there's no unicorns. Nobody's ever seen a unicorn. Uh, but unicorns might exist. And if you say that they might exist, then they might exist in A. Uh, so there is a possible world where unicorns could exist, even though they don't exist in the actual world. Uh, that's a statement that is uh, logically coherent. Uh, but now what about this statement? A square has four sides in X, but not in A. Is that a coherent statement? Uh, is there a possible world where a square does not have four sides. Well, now using modal logic, uh, we would want to say, no, this is not a coherent statement. Uh, now, I want to be clear about this because uh, if we were in a classroom, we would have some time to discuss this. Uh, but one of the things that uh, sometimes people will say in a classroom is, uh, well, there is a possible world uh, where we label something that in the actual world acts as a square, but we label it something else in the possible world. Uh, well, in that case, there are possible worlds where we call squares something else. Uh, like there might be a possible world where people call a square a circle. Um, that is possible, but that's not what's being argued here when we're talking about possible world semantics. Uh, what we're talking about is the concept of a square. Uh, the concept of a square has four sides, not just in the actual world, uh, but it has four sides in every possible world. Uh, so the concept of a square uh, does not change in any possible world. Uh, that's what modal lo logic is trying to, to get after. Um, South Dakota State University in Brookings uh, has a nursing degree in X. So there's an actual world, so the world that we live in. Uh, there is a nursing degree at South Dakota State University. Uh, but there is a possible world, possible world D, where there is no nursing degree. That is a perfectly coherent statement. There is a possible world where uh, South Dakota State does not have a nursing degree. Uh, well, let's take the statement, humans cannot fly in X, but humans might be able to fly in B. Is that logically coherent? Um, well, there could be some debate about this statement. Uh, so uh, somebody might argue that uh, if you go into possible world and let's say uh, humans have wings all of a sudden and you change the makeup of humans slightly, uh, that they're able to fly, uh, well then somebody might say, well, in that case, they're not really humans. Um, I don't want to get into that debate uh, because really what you could say with this statement, I think this is a coherent statement, uh, you could say that there's an actual world where humans are no different at all than what we are right now, and yet um, maybe the environment of that world is different enough to where uh, flight is actually possible given uh, how we actually are right now. And so there might be a possible world where humans can fly. So this seems to be a perfectly coherent statement. Uh, but now we have another statement that uh, is logically incoherent, and that's the statement uh, 2 plus 2 equals 4 in X, but it might not in A. Uh, this would be a statement that I would uh, argue is logically incoherent using modal logic, uh, because if you understand the terms correctly, there's not a possible world where 2 plus 2 equals anything else uh, except for 4. Uh, well now, so hopefully that gives you just a basic understanding of possible world semantics. Uh, now we get to the modal ontological argument and we ask the question, what kind of being is God?
Now, I'm going to introduce uh, another category for you here. Um, you could think of God as a contingent necessary being. And arguably, this is what uh, Anselm's argument is doing. Uh, sometimes this is called a factually necessary being. Uh, so you can conceive of God being a contingent or factually necessary being. In the actual world, God is the necessary being. Uh, or you could also consider God as being a logically necessary being. Uh, and modal logic helps us make this distinction. And the modal ontological argument is going to argue that God is actually a logically necessary being. So let's consider the phrase again, that which none greater can be conceived. Uh, according to the modal argument, this statement says that God is a logically necessary being, or maximally great being. And so here's how we might present this version of the argument. Premise one. It is possible that a maximally great being exists. And so premise one is just trying to get us to think whether or not the existence of this type of God, a maximally great being, is this being even possible to exist? Two, if it is possible that a maximally great being exists, then it follows that a maximally great being exists in some possible worlds. Uh, this is now using possible world semantics. So to say that it's possible, it means there is a possible world where a maximally great being exists. Three, if a maximally great being exists in some possible world, then it exists in every possible world. Four, if a maximally great being exists in every possible world, then it exists in the actual world because the actual world is one of the possible worlds. Five, if a maximally great being exists in the actual world, then really we're just saying a maximally great being exists. Therefore, a maximally great being does exist. Uh, well, some of you might be wondering, what? How do we get there? Uh, well, again, let's try to visualize uh, the argument here. So, uh, again, what this is saying is that God is a logically necessary being. And so if you understand God correctly, and if, again, this... Don't think of it just as the definition of the term, but what the advocates of the ontological argument want to get you to think is what conception of God is it that you actually have? So they want to say God is a logically necessary being. This is the definition of God that we're thinking about. And so a being uh, whose existence is necessary is what we mean when we're talking about God. So take again the statement 2 plus 2 equals 4. So to say that 2 plus 2 necessarily equals 4 is just to say that the statement 2 plus 2 does not equal 4 is a logical contradiction. In other words, there's not a possible world in which 2 plus 2 does not equal 4. You're uttering a contradiction. Those who are arguing for the modal ontological argument are saying to say that God does not exist is to utter a contradiction, a logical contradiction, in a similar way. Because what you're saying is that a being who exists out of logical necessity does not exist. And that is logically incoherent. In other words, if there is a possible world where a logical, necessary being like God exists, then it follows that such a being must exist in every possible world. And if this being exists in every possible world, it exists in the actual world, and therefore this being exists. Uh, so to sum up the argument, you have God as a contingent necessary being, or a factual necessary being. Uh, this is uh, Anselm's traditional version of the ontological argument, uh, where God is the necessary being that exists outside of all of the realm of contingency. When we're using modal uh, arguments, we're saying that God is a logically necessary being, and if God exists, or if it's possible that God exists, then it follows logically that God must exist in every possible world. Uh, okay, so hopefully um, this lecture made some sense. Uh, I hope you had um, somewhat of a light bulb moment, but if you didn't, don't feel bad because um, most people, when they're first introduced to this argument, don't have that light bulb moment. Um, but uh, if you have any questions, you can certainly email me um, and... Uh, Make sure that you go through the readings, the Anselm reading, uh, the response from Ganilio, um, and the reading from Plantinga.
Um, and again, if you have any questions, you can uh, let me know.